If you're blue and you don't know where your last breath is gonna go, don't have a fit. Try chills from the crypt. Don't forget to bring the digitalis. Every Wednesday evening, your best pal is the real heartbreaker. Come with me and we'll attend. The massacre your mind will bend while your side split. The opinions, viewpoints, and beliefs presented on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the management, the affiliates, and broadcast partners, or the sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. everyone and welcome to Scarefest Radio, soon to be Scarefest Television, just to stop the confusion that we be running. It's, it's just like when we started doing September 12th through the 15th for the Scarefest, because everybody says, oh, we didn't know anything was going on on Thursday, and just as soon as we started announcing it that way, everybody goes, oh, will, every, will all the stars be there Thursday? Hell no. Uh um, it's just, it's just, a, it's for party, uh, launch party, uh, axe throwing, uh, ghost hunt, all kinds of stuff on Thursday. Everybody, uh, Scarefest Radio, tonight my guest is Mr. John Kassir, and uh, I got a cute little story, and he, I can already tell this is going to be a fun one, because even during the commercial break, he's doing shit on camera, trying to crack up me, your, your, your host. So, um, we got that going on. Now, why in the world is Chad Spectrum? Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, of course, everybody. Look you know, at this. Scarefest Radio, the radio you can see. We're totally going to use that. I've already <laughs> warned you. I hope, there, I hope there's no legality issues. Yeah, there's uh, your new drop. Uh, <laughs> I actually. I, I, w- I wish I was the kind of guy, John, that got on my guest. Give me one of those. Uh, James Earl Jones things like, you know, you're watching CNN, you know, and they say, hey, did you say you're watching uh, Scarefest? You're watching CNN. You're watching Fearfest Television, the radio you can see. <laughs> see, this is where it's going. Um, okay, now, uh, before we get into the frivolity of it, I love telling the story, John. Because, now, John, you were booked at Scarefest, I think it was two years ago, and you had to cancel it. But right about the right before you had to cancel, um, you were booked on the old Scarefest radio show. So in the middle of the week, uh, is this 2017? I was there. It was you. You you had to cancel when you're maybe a while back. Last time I was there for the 17th, yeah, because we did we did your morning your local morning show uh, in the lobby of the show. Call me Joe Biden. I fucked up half the story. <laughs> the point is, the point is, I was setting up the, the show with you. And you called me. You called me. Layla gave you my number, and you called me. And everyone, uh-huh. this man calls me. I'm at work, and I'm, I, I answer my cell phone, and he, and he goes, this is John Cassir. And you, it took me so off guard to get a, a call from a famous person. That was just acting. You, you were on the phone and you were acting like we were best friends forever. And I just want to say that shows me you're a class act, Mr. Casera. Yeah, I'll do anything for a dime. <laughs> <laughs> you're on the wrong radio show, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me let me that's put you in the budget. I'm, that's probably all I'm going to see, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'll put it this way: I'll make sure, John, that you make double what I make. Fabulous. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, I, I, technically, you don't need money. So I'm in the whole world. Now, um, one thing, now, we're just going to go on into your background. One thing I did not know about you, 
And my wife didn't know because she saw one of the scrolls that I had on one of the TVs. You, sir, were on Star Search. I was. I was on Star Search. And uh, I was. Uh, are you guys still there? Yes, yes, we're here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my face disappeared on my feed, so I just wanted to make sure that I was still there. You just interrupt me if you're not hearing me. Um, no, I was uh, I was in an off Broadway show about stand up comics. I actually hadn't even done stand up comedy uh, professionally. I uh, had done sketch comedy for years as well. You know, I had, uh, I was a, a New York uh, theater actor and had done musicals uh, off Broadway and uh, that kind of thing. And I got in a new. Uh, New York Broadway musical called Three Guys Naked from the Waist Down. Um, if you can imagine that, uh, ladies. Uh, no, I, was it actually Naked from the Waist Down? It was the, a metaphor for how a stand-up comic feels in front of an audience when uh, when uh, you're bombing. But it was uh, it was a show about stand-up comics, a musical. Think uh, Dream Girls, but with stand-up comics. And starred me and uh, Scott Bakula. And uh, a guy named Jerry Coker, who uh, went on to write for <clears throat> shows like Growing Pains and that kind of thing. But Jerry um, had been a Broadway actor and, and wrote this show for himself and uh, us. And um, I had been street performing uh, to supplement my income, which, you know, theater pays so little. I made more money street performing in front of the Metropolitan Museum in New York than I made ever made in the theater. And uh, so I played uh, this kind of Andy Kaufman type, very damaged comic, interesting character. And it was a big hit off Broadway. And uh, Star Search saw me on the show and they said, hey, we got this new show, show Star Search. We want you to be on it. And I said, what is a singer? I said, you know, I'm a singer. I, you know, I can sing. I'm in a, a music. But, I, you know. Sam Harris was tearing it up on the show at the time, and uh, we all know what happened with him. He was such, such a, a, a is up as well. And they said, "No, we want you to be on as a stand-up comic." And I go, "Well, you know, I'm not really a stand-up comic. It's a part that I'm playing." They go, "Well, you can win a hundred thousand dollars." I went, "Fuck! Have you seen my act?" <laughs> so uh, I said, "Hell, I'll do it." Uh, so. <laughs> Um, they were already uh, set for their semifinals for that year. So I came on at the end of the first season and uh, kept winning. I, you know, I was writing uh, my own material to come on the show and just kept winning and wound up coming back the second season as the um, returning champion. Wound up in the semifinals and uh, beat Rosie O'Donnell, who was uh, just beginning to be known. Um, in the semifinals and beat Simbad in the finals and won $100,000. And the next thing I know, they're like, hey, you're going to open for Tom Jones in Vegas. And uh, I'm like, everybody's patting me on the back and stuff. And I'm like, I can't open for Tom Jones in Vegas. And they're like, why not? And I go, I don't have any fucking act. Um, so, uh, you know, so I got my ass into the, the, the clubs and I started, you know, I had this work up starting out as an opening act, 20 minutes. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, after winning Star Search, everybody wanted me to headline in their clubs. And um, so I had to, to get together an hour, an hour and a half act. And um, so my introduction to the Hollywood scene part of the business was as a stand up comic, not as an actor. I had to claw my way back into the into the acting uh, part of the business um, after that. Uh, but it was a double-edged sword because uh, I mean, it also uh, boosted me into the television industry. My first series was First in Ten on HBO. And, um, you know, they knew because I didn't really have a lot of material when I, they started telling me I gotta, I'm going to have to do all these shows. I started doing all these voices and characters in my act. I didn't really have a lot of stand-up material Um one of my signature pieces was I do the I do the Wizard of Oz in two and a half minutes. As mayor of the Munchkin City in the county of the land of Oz, we welcome you most regally. But we gotta verify it legally. 
As coroner, I must concur. I thoroughly examined her. And she's not only me. <laughs> anyway, we don't want, to, want you to have to pay rights for that. But, um, uh, you know, so uh, for, for a number of years, HBO 10 football team, I played the Bulgarian field goal kicker, Zagreb Shkanuski. I could kick uh, 60 yard field goals and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, OJ Simpson was the general manager on the show and uh, Delta Burke owned this, owned this team. And they had all these famous football players on the show. And uh, um, I remember one, a couple of the seasons, um, uh, uh, God, uh, what's his name from SVU? Um, uh, one of my favorite actors, uh, my mind is not clicking. I'm on Chris uh, Maloney. Shoulder... Chris Maloney, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm on I'm on painkillers right now. I had shoulder surgery. <laughs> so um, this is me. Hi, folks. Hi. <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm only on mild painkillers, so I'm only mildly high. Um, anyway, uh, you know, they knew that I did a bunch of voices and characters. HBO knew that I did a bunch of voices and characters in my act, and they needed somebody who could be an actor and do a voice and be funny and, you know, do a stand-up kind of delivery, and they invited me to, to go audition for uh, at Kevin Yeager's studio to play the Crypt Keeper, and that's how I got the part. Okay, beautiful story. What kind of effed up American dream is this? You kick Rosie O'Donnell's ass and uh, <laughs> Sinbad's ass to win a stand-up comedy thing that you're not even a stand-up comedian. <laughs> and now you're this famous voice actor who only did voices, if I understand the, court, the story correctly, because you didn't think you were going to have enough material as a stand-up comedian. That is people. That's correct. Children. <laughs> <laughs> this goes to show you if you if you half ass it and don't apply yourself at all, you still got a pretty god dang good chance. Um, no, that's that was when it comes down to it, it was all acting. You know, it's like yeah. it's like I I remember at, at age forty, I wanted to start playing golf, and the and the my golf instructor was like, "Well, you're an actor, right?" And I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Well, act like a golfer," and all of a sudden, my golf game got better. <laughs> you know. I, I've, I've been told that I should start acting like a faith dealer just to heal people. I'm going to take just a quick commercial break, and then we're going to come back and turn it over to Chad. But we got to pay the bills. <laughs> the Mystical Fair is Lexington, Kentucky's only monthly psychic and holistic healing arts fair. And each month, the Mystical Fair offers the best in psychics, intuitives, and mediums, as well as a variety of metaphysical vendors local artisans and crafters, and independently owned small merchants who offer unique and special items. And don't forget, lots of free seminars that you will find in the world. Make plans to visit the Mystical Fair on this uh, September 28th and 29th. That is a change from the September dates and posting, but it's at 1084 Whippleport in the Employment Solutions Building just off of Newtown Pike in Lexington. Visit their website, mysticalfairlex.com, to learn more. Chad, over to you. It's good to talk to you, John. Uh, I have to admit that when I found out tonight uh, I was going to be talking with you, I, I became starstruck. Uh, I think you've been on every TV show that I've ever cared about, <laughs> uh, starting with First and Ten and Dream On. Um uh, I, I love those shows, and I loved your work on them. Thanks. Uh, when you uh, you talked a little bit about your voice work. By the way, Chad watched those shows because there was the first TV shows where they showed tits, just so you know. Well, it is in here. I, I might have been <laughs> younger than I was supposed to be watching that, yeah. But I appreciated, I appreciated that you liked my work on it. <laughs> well, they weren't yours. <laughs> I'm kidding. They're really funny shows, actually. They, they were great. Um, you uh, you talked about your voice work some, and you talked about your live acting. Mm -hmm. uh, which do you prefer, and uh, and and how do you uh, get ready for these roles? Well, you know, I mean, they're 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 almost like different skill sets. So I don't know if there's a preference. It really just has to do with um, 
You know, honestly, you know, I studied as a theater actor and I, I love being on stage because you're in front of a live audience and there's nothing like that, you know, working in front of, you know, without a net with other actors and you get the rehearsal process, which is a lot of fun and you really get to, you know, do your best work because you have all that rehearsal and you really get to do it. You know, when you do a TV show or something, you kind of show up, you shake hands and it's like, okay, uh, you, you guys are... Uh, old friends and you know you've known each other for 30 years and um you know i, I did a, a guest star on uh ncis and i had you know i had to walk in and pretend i was old friends with robert wagner meanwhile robert wagner is somebody that's uh, i've been watching on tv since i was a little kid you know and and i couldn't believe it you know i first had to get over the you know being starstruck myself and then you know created an instant rapport with Robert, who was unbelievable to work with. He was he was fantastic, but you know theater you get to you get to uh, you know really get to know each other and 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 flesh out the material literally and and that kind of thing, and so that's you know that's the most fun. Of course, it's also the the one that pays the least. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's that. So you can't always afford to just go do theater whenever you want. You can't pay your bills, you know. I mean, you can if you want to live, you know, a really, really modest life. But, um, you know, some of the big Broadway actors that are triple threats, that are, that are big stars on, in musicals on Broadway are able to make a nice living uh, doing that kind of thing. But um, otherwise, it's something you do for the art. Uh, you know, I, my wife's a theater actress. Uh, she's an uh, actress that could do everything. She's a voice actress and a movie actress and a theater actress. And But she's a really good theater actress. That's why I call her that. I mean that as a compliment. And um, we met in the theater working together. But, um, you know, voiceover is a lot of fun because I get to play things that I just don't get to play on camera or on stage. Um, you know, I mean, I got to play Deadpool. I got to play, you know, uh, Elliot the Dragon and Pete's Dragon. I got to play, you know, I get to play the Crypt Keeper. I get to play so many different, you know, Surfer Dude Dad, you know, Ray Rocket on Rocket Power. I mean, all these great characters that I probably would never get to play otherwise. Um, you don't even need to be human. Plus, as, you know, the older you get, there's just less parts for you as you get older as an actor. Not that I'm that old. It's just that's just the way it works. There's the younger you are, the more parts there are for you uh, written into scripts. So as you get older, it's great. It's, you know, voiceover is kind of age proof. I can play little kids. I can play old people. I can play, you know, women. I can play raccoons. I can play, you know, whatever they throw at me. So it's kind of a cool thing. So they all have their benefits uh, in terms of that. And um, uh, that's the best I can answer that question for you. Oh, uh, that was great. Um, and you just mentioned Deadpool, uh, obviously an iconic character. Uh, how much did uh, did you get to create that yourself? Or how much did they want you to, to kind of copy the theatrical version? Well, uh, the version I did was before the theatrical version. Was it before? Version. Yeah, long before. Uh, the very first time you saw Deadpool um, created for the screen was uh, I voiced him. He was uh, up until then, he was just in, in comic books. And um, he made his appearance uh, with X-Men Legends and uh, X-Men Ultimate Alliance and Spider-Man Ultimate Alliance and these these um, these games. And they thought of me, you know, because of the sarcasm, I guess they thought of me because of the Crypt Keeper. You know, they thought that I could deliver that kind of thing. Plus, he talked, you know, they knew he was going to be breaking the fourth wall and talking to the camera. So it was kind of, you know, perfect for my skill set at that time. So I'm sure you know. that it was. A and then it got down to me and Ryan Reynolds for the movie. And, um, uh, you know, it was not. <laughs> Uh, hey, you never know. I, uh, I, no, I know actually, I, I so love what they did with the movie because when when we first started recording the show, um, you know, I, they don't really want you to improvise with those things too much. But I was just for fun and cursing and doing stuff like that. They're like, uh, we're going to have kids playing these games. You can't be doing that stuff. But to me, that's what that character was. It was kind of a no holds barred kind of thing. And I love that they went that route with it for the movie. You know, I think they really captured what my concept of what the uh, what Deadpool would be, you know. 
Yeah, it, it's great. And I'm sure that they uh, pulled some inspiration from your version. Uh, hey, you'd like to think so. <laughs> uh, you, you talked about some of the video games and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Is the process on that different than what you do to get ready for the uh, the other voice work, or is it much more scripted or less scripted, or, uh, no, or what do they let you do? More like a movie script, you know. Um, you know, have a, more of a, um, you know, you're sometimes you're there with the other actors playing off each other and that kind of thing. Um, and then some of the other games are you just go line by line and give them different versions of each line. It's pretty much, you know. Um, you're acting in a void line by line, and it's and it's hard work. Is it, you know, it's not as easy as you might think. You know, it's it's amazing. Uh, um, you know, you're working on Batman Arkham and that kind of thing, and it's you know, and you know that those those games are revered, and uh, you're trying to bring what you can to some, you know, some cowardly villain or whatever it is you're playing, and. Um, for the most part, once you nail it, they 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 cut you loose. But you know they they want they want to have their options to make sure that uh, you know that the game has options when they're playing it, so they can bring it to life as much as possible. So it's it's a little bit it's a little bit more of a tedious process. It's not the same kind of thing. But then there are other games that were more you know might have like a Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of script, and you know you're playing some fun character, and it's it's much more like doing. Uh, like other kinds of animation, recording it. Yeah. Uh, let's throw it back over to Wes for a little while. Well, everybody, you know the rules. We're going to just go ahead and we're gonna knock out another quick working break. And we'll be right back with more. Jobs. <laughs> Do you feel lost in life? Do you seem to be stuck in emotions that are not yours? Is your home not the sanctuary it should be? Contact Spirit Mechanics, where they take a team approach to your metaphysical and spiritual problems. Spirit Mechanics specializes in aura cleansing, stone attunement, attachment removal, and house cleansings. Spirit Mechanics tailors their approach to your individual spiritual path and needs. Find them every month at Lexington, Kentucky's Mystical Fair, mysticalfairlex.com, or on Facebook by searching Spirit Mechanics, that's M-E-C-H-A-N-I-X. Spirit Mechanics, for your spiritual health and well-being. Now, if you've been watching and listening to my shows for a while, you've undoubtedly heard me talk about Mark and Johnny James of Akashic Awareness in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Akashic Awareness is a metaphysical healing and learning center unlike any other in Kentucky. A large selection of crystals, gems, and minerals greet you the minute you walk in the door. And from that point onward, the journey is yours. They offer a great selection of metaphysical tools, state of the art healing, classes and lectures. The great thing, and I have encrypted you from actually back to the encrypted material this is really awesome. He brings in these special events uh during the week and on the week. Uh now this is one I, I shit I'm gonna try not to mess it up. Jin Jin Shin Jitsu. And this is an ancient healing art of harmonizing the body through general touch, like acupuncture. Uh, it uses light touch for the specific areas of your body. This is coming out tomorrow, August 31st, uh, noon till 7 p.m. Uh, Rachel Central will be there with your massage on the 5th. There's always something about going on. AkashicAwareness.com. Visit their website, get on their email list, and, uh, Go, go visit them soon. All right, back to the show. Um, now, of course, uh, as as John intimated earlier, what'd you get done to your your arm, your shoulder? Um, you know, sometimes you know, like they told me, if you do this motion too much over a long period of time, uh, that's, eventually... carpal, that's carpal tunnel. I know that. <laughs> no, I. I, I... I have the whole shoulder and arm into it. You know, it really depends on how long you got to go. 
Um, touche. Touche. <laughs> I've invested yet again. Uh, no, it's it's years of doing stuff like Three Guys Naked from the Waist Down, through to fall into, you know, street performing, and I played lacrosse. So, uh, yeah, I was lacrosse. I think I, I tore my body up. I'm paying for it. And uh, I had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, 50% tear of the bicep tendon in my in my right shoulder and uh, 80% in the rotator cuff. So um, I had the surgery for it. Uh, the surgery went well, but it's the, the healing is slow and painful. They take you to physical therapy and make you cry. Move it like this. The shoulder I, I is a weird stare, joint. I fear that I'm staring down the, the, the barrel of that gun. And, and you know the place that it affects me the worst? But I, most of mine's have been worth working. But when I do conventions, when I stand there so much, shaking hands and all that, that is the most painful thing. I can work all day. It will bother me. But yeah. Every weekend, shaking hands and, and hugging people. People come up and want hugs. Did, did, you, did you have to do the one-arm thing to get around it? Well, I haven't gotten a chance to do it yet because this is new. So we'll see. The, you know, Scarefest is going to be my first convention since uh, since having the surgery. So, um, you know, uh, I'm going to have to... Um, you know, I'm going to have to to put myself on there. Uh, you know, it, uh, probably people will be sliding the photos in front of me, and I'm just going to be able to uh, just just do a signature, and that's about it. And of course, you know me; I put out for the fans. So, you know, I mean, I I want to have a good time, but I won't be I won't be doing my normal jumping around, you right. know, photo bombing other people's photos and stuff. <laughs> that won't be happening. But. Um, we'll be having a good time anyway. It's, you know, it's a matter of having fun and having some mutual respect with the fans and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I want to be there for everybody. I, I said, I'd be there and I'm going to be there. You know, I do have work the day before it's luckily it's recording. I'm, I don't really have anything on camera right now that, um, I took off for August so that I, you know, could heal, but, uh, it takes a lot longer than that. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, that's why, you know, I, I have work on Friday, so they have a short weekend. I'll get there Friday night and, uh, but, uh, probably too late for the, 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 um, signing session, but I'll be there all day Saturday and, uh, the first half of the day Sunday. And then I get to get back for Sunday night because I got to work again on Monday, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be a good time. Now, one thing, whilst I was doing my usual volumes and volumes of research on my desk, um, the, um, the whole, the whole Crypt Keeper thing, have, have they finally poked a fork in that? I don't know. I am getting the low, uh, low, uh, can you see me? Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. It just, yeah. my, apparently my video crashed. Yay. Yay. Right. Yes, ladies. From the dark. Comes John Casilla. <laughs> no, then, the door now. Okay, so everybody, uh -huh. we'll just have to listen to him now. There we are. Um. Like All right, now it's, it's fine. fine. Yay, it's fine. Shoot okay. Okay. Now, shoot the okay. engineer. Poking a fork with a. Uh, uh, well, the Crypt Crib Keeper will never die. I mean, you know, I mean, it's been around since the 50s and 60s with the comic book, and now we're on the TV show. And, um, uh, and you know, of course, the TV show was, was, was amazing. I mean, that's what put it on the map for new generations of people who, um, who grew up, you know, with Tales from the Crypt. It was it was the gateway drug to a lot of people for horror. And um, so, and I'm so glad to have popped your scary. <laughs> As I like to tell them. But, um, you know, we're always trying to get the rights back. It's really a matter of getting the rights back from EC Comics. And, you know, these things always involve them giving the rights back to us as opposed to somebody else and then you know and also it involved money and lawyers and being able to to get it at a price where you can also afford to still make a show it was a very expensive show to make in the first place um you know the 
all the artisans that worked on that show were the top in the field and they did it as favors because um, and worked for very little money with very small budgets. But because of that, they did a lot of very creative things uh, with the show. So um, that show over the, you know, with the top cinematographers and, and art directors and writers and directors and uh, makeup artists and, and effects artists and this kind of thing. And they all, you know, wanted to work for the biggest guys in the business, which were our producers, um, you know, Richard Donner, Walter Hill, Bob Zemeckis, David Geiler, uh, Joel, and Joel Silver, you know, and, um, you know, getting the rights back uh, from EC Comics is is uh, is what we hope to do, but it, there's no guarantee it'll happen. So, you know, they always tried to make the show something that was hard to get a hold of, just like the comic books, to make it collectible. Um, you know, every time they made dolls or they did any kind of memorabilia, that kind of thing, it was all, um, you know, they made only a limited edition of everything because they wanted it to be the same thing for collectors. And that was the feel of the comic book, and they wanted to, they wanted to honor that. They wanted the show to feel like the comic book. They wanted the merchandising to feel like the comic book. They wanted everything about it to feel like the comic book. So, and I thought that they were really successful with it. I, I, I collected the comic books as a kid, and I just thought it was really kind of an honor to be not only a part of it, but to be a part of this this version of it. That's pretty cool. What well, time I, do we have? How much more time do we have? Just I'm only asking because uh, because um, I, I have a, a professional dinner engagement in a few, and I just want to make sure to get you in. Uh, so if you have, uh, give me your best. Give me your best questions now. <laughs> well, I've lost no my pressure. co-host, so it's it, it's all on me now. Uh, but everybody, uh, John warned me that he might have fails. Anytime you want to fail. I do want to uh, ask him at the end of where we started this whole conversation. Because the other part of that story is, now, to get the Crypt Keeper voice part, you actually beat. Now, here, at that time, would you say you were recognized in the industry as a singer? Because you actually beat two professional voice actors. Uh, you know, I, 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 I hadn't worked as a, as a voice actor. I mean, literally the, the, the fact that I'm one of the top voice actors today was due to the fact that I got the part of the Crypt Keeper and uh, was able to get myself the best agent in, in, in Hollywood, uh, voiceover agent in Hollywood. And I'm still with them after uh, that was 1988. So, you know, I mean, I've been with them ever since. So. Um, and they're awesome. I'm with DPN and, uh, uh, used to be the ICM voiceover department and they went, um, they went rogue, although they still handle all the, the top ICM clients. Um, and, uh, and they're just, they're just the best. So, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there was, there was all kinds of actors in there that I remember. It was a handful. You know, they wanted people who could be a, a good actor, a good voice actor, and also uh, funny. So they wanted you to bring your personality to it. Um, but who were the voice actors you were referring to that you didn't know? Uh, I forget the, the name of the one guy, but he's, he's famous for doing the, um, the police, police cat. Oh, you're talking about Michael Winslow. Yeah. Uh, he was one of them. Um, and I'm too stupid to remember who the other one was. But I mean, I'll put it this way. Not being a showbiz guy, when when I see a name pop up on a report like that and I recognize the people, it shows it, it shows that you you were up against some heavy duty time. Uh, now one more yeah. now this is one I'm gonna ask you and it's just one of those esoteric things that you haven't thought about. But it, uh, looking back on your career, okay, over uh -huh. hundred movie credits, but have you ever just sat back over the years and, and kind of cataloged in your mind how many different voices, not only variations of the same person, but how many distinct characters that you come up with? Oh, man, I couldn't even tell you. I couldn't even tell you. You know, somebody... It was a, a, a fan um, who showed up at my table for one of the conventions, and he had... Um, 
done like a composite of, I think, about 48 different characters. And I had to go through them and look them up, look up some of them myself because I don't always get to see uh, most of the time. You don't even get to see what they look like. You know, I mean, if it's a new character that you're creating and um, they don't really. You, you know, make but some of the stuff I look at it and I go, I don't even really know what that is. I have to look it up. So I did a contest. Um, I think I owe, actually owe whoever won it <laughs> a signed copy of that uh, composite uh, uh, of who could tell me what, who all the characters were. And so I looked at that and I go, well, that's, and people are like, oh, is that all the characters you've done? I was like, I can't even, that can't even be close to all the characters I've done. But, um, but you know, there's so many that I couldn't even tell you what they are. Every once in a while, I have a conversation with somebody, and they go, "Oh, we worked together on that thing that was blah blah blah." And I was like, "Holy crap! I forgot all about that one. That was so much fun. That was a great character. I wonder what happened to that character." Blah blah blah, you know. And um, but yeah, it's it's uh, you know, when you start out as an actor, you think you're either going to never work, or you're going to be a poor, you know, whatever, and you're going to wind up like selling selling, um, you know. Xerox copiers or something for a living um, because you don't really develop any other skill set. My parents were like, don't you want something to fall back on? And I was like, anything else that I would fall back on would be harder for me. Um, but, uh, you know, you either think you're going to be incredibly poor or you're going to be hugely famous and rich. You don't realize that there's the possibility for you to, to stay um, – you, you diversified and make a career for 40 years as an actor. This is my 40th year as an actor, professional actor, as uh, supporting myself as an actor, um, solely as an actor. And that, to me, that's, uh, you know, it's a lot to be proud about. And, you know, uh, sometimes I wish it was a lot easier at times to just say that, um, you know, I got famous fast and stayed there, but that doesn't work that way. Even even, uh, you know, some of some of the people who have who have maintained their careers in this business at the top are are good at just that. I mean, somebody like Madonna or somebody like that who had so many different years at the top is somebody who's got a talent for reinventing themselves uh, at the top. And that's not an easy thing for anybody to do. Uh, other people can't come and go and they come and go again and or they they come and they're gone and you never see them again. There were so many great comedians when I came on the scene. And uh, when I came on the scene after winning Star Search, I mean, this was the time that Jerry Seinfeld uh, was hitting and and um, Jay Leno was already doing the road. And he just he hadn't even started filling in for Johnny Carson yet. And uh, Bill Maher was just starting out. Uh, you know, he had a, a, a modest act. It wasn't even close to the political humor that he's able to nail now. He, he developed so far along and guys like Emo Phillips and Sam Kinison. And, you know, I'd, I'd go to the improv and I'd, you know, because I was an actor, they'd invite me up to work out on the stage, on the improv stage with guys like Robin Williams and Rick Overton and and um, Charles Flesher. And, you know, we'd all get up on stage together and, and make everybody laugh. And uh, so, and you know how many of these guys came and went, you know, it's, uh, I kind of felt like, you know, at, uh, after winning Star Search and, and realizing what it was like to be famous, I kind of felt like, you know, you give somebody the power to give you everything that you ask for. They also have the power to take it all away. So I kind of, um, I kind of spent more time being a good actor and, 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 getting myself work in many different aspects of what I love doing more than worrying about whether I was promoting myself. You know, I, I, I kind of feel proud of the fact that my characters are more famous than me. I mean, that, that feels like I did, I did a good job. And with that, I'll leave you. Good night. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was getting ready to let you go. You, you've said out 15 minutes more than I, than I was afraid to be able to. John, Thanks. Great talking to you. Looking forward to seeing you at the Scarefest this year. And uh, good good luck with your healing and recovery. 
Thanks, creeps. I look forward to seeing you. My old bones will make their way there. <laughs> Yeah, that's totally going on my voice, man. Okay. I'm gonna... <laughs> we're gonna unceremoniously hang up on genuine famous person. John is here now so that he can go take another pain pill. Everybody! Okay, we're gonna take a uh, final commercial break, and then we'll come back and see what all's been going on at the Scarefest. Get, get, get some money. Uh, get you to spend some money with us. We'll be right back. Everyone is talking about CBD oil. Most of us know that CBD is a cannabis compound that has significant medical benefits, but does not make people high. Its benefits include pain relief, anti-seizure properties, anxiety relief, fights cancer, reduces the risk of diabetes, and it is even used as a sleep aid. Blue Leaf Naturals CBD and hemp products are full spectrum hemp extract oils. They use only hemp grown in Kentucky, supporting Kentucky farmers and businesses and helping you and your family stay healthy and well. Blue Leaf Naturals, created with care from seed to shelf. Visit their website at blueleafnaturals.com. Blue Leaf Naturals, a Kentucky proud company. Coyote Chris Sutton. Shamanism. Spiritual advisement. Paranormal investigations. Inspirational presentations. Bringing light to the darkest places for over 20 years. Go to coyotechris.com to learn more. Now, before we get back to business on Surface Radio, I'm going to get back to business. Blue Leaf Naturals, Naturals.com. Some of you don't like the mailers. I get CBD, you can buy it in. Guess what? You can buy Blue Leaf Naturals in there anywhere. Uh, go to the website. Pull it up on your little place. Go to the website. But they've got Nutrition in You and Lexington. Ash for this in e town. Happy Meadow Natural Foods in Berea. Uh, they've got uh, Purple Haze has three locations in Lexington. Danville Nutrition in Danville. Cynthia Campbell, who is, might be my the most talented interviewer. But anyway, she sells it. There's, and, uh, there's a whole slew of other people. Go to the website, littleleafnaturals.com, click on Rebo Partners, find it close to you. Alright, now, what I want to do before we close out the show, we've gotten some of the pre-sale stuff, uh, stuff that you can go ahead and buy now and beat the line. For example, the Bruce Campbell fan pack. Now, they're, they're doing a line skip. Remember the line skip? Four, no. 50 line skips per day per fan pack. So that that tells you how and that that tells you how how closely we're, we're limiting um, these these lines. So we do Bruce in particular is going to only be there with his kid and the kind of photo ops and um, uh, does the signing and then does his panel. He's got a limited amount of time. He's not going to stay there till midnight signing autographs. So get your fan pack. One autograph, eight by ten, from the table. He doesn't do, he doesn't do selfies. He wants you to have a professional experience with the photo. Autograph, eight by ten, line skip, Bruce Campbell. Half Thor Bjornsson is our other one that we posted this week. You get an autograph, eight by ten, one line skip. Also, same limitations. Same limitations. Um, that is a, a, another one if you're wanting to, uh, get your autograph, uh, Keep that in again. Check that out. Just released today. After a little drama on, on, on Twitter because Wesley didn't think they were going to have a, uh, a fan pack for Steve. But they do have a fan pack for Steve. Autographed 8 by 10 plus a selfie plus one line skip. If you're wanting to get in Steve Ulrich and Ulrich's uh, line and uh, save you a little time, enjoy the convention. This card and pack is on sale. 
the scarefest.com for all of us. Celebrity Ghost Hunt on Thursday, but this is our launch day ghost hunt. Uh, Dave, Dave Gonzalez and, uh, um, Dave Tango. I'm having a hell of a time right. Steve Gonzalez and Dave Tango, both of which I know, I, I know very well. Uh, they're doing the ghost up at night. They're doing, uh, it's hosted by Alan Winery. Tickets are on sale now, and, uh, they're going to have a wine case. It's going to be a good to do. It's going to be a good to do. And, of course, our Saturday hunt. That is featuring the, the, uh, Ghost Brothers, Rape Chasers, and I've got the old man around. I need to be there. Uh, uh, Gary Kennedy's going to be there. So that's our Saturday Celebrity Ghost Tour. Um, it's all this. Very old, um, Civil War era mansion in the heart of Lexington. On sale now. EastCarefest.com. Don't forget, go ahead and order your t-shirts. That's when they said I've got a, uh, this fellow in the fall. Yeah. It, it happens on the news. Why wouldn't it happen? Anyway. Scarefest t-shirts are on sale. Go to the merchant. I think it's on the merchandise on the website. Scarefest.com. Um, merchandise. And, uh, collect the pictures and it will take you right to the shopping center. Photo ops. We're still posting photo ops. I am not sticking my neck out. I tell you, we will and will not have a photo op. We are still posting photo ops. Check it daily. Watch on the Facebook group. But, uh, photo ops are on set. If you want photo ops, now these are limited time. They don't, I've never seen them actually, I don't know if I think they put a hard cap in the number they sell, but I need to know they only want to see, the celebrities only want to be away from the food. X amount of times for Some of these could sell out. I just don't know the numbers. And I do want to talk about Hero Day. Hero Day is Friday. If you are in the first responder business or if you're, um, uh, military, uh, you be tired of or active, get into it. Okay, so, so that is at the tick group. You don't have to do that online. Uh, you just show up, show your identification, and we will sway you in. And, uh, the other thing I want to say is Kids Day. Kids Day is Sunday. We will have activities for the kids. We will have a costume contest for the kids. And it's always a thing to do on Sunday. And of course, it's still in the day for all of you. It's like this whole family. Everybody, this has been Scarefest Radio coming up on the con. We're getting the last bit of detail rolled out. And thank you for watching tonight. I just want to thank my guest, Mr. John Casier. Well, thank Chad Harlan. We got booted halfway through the episode. That, that's what caught happen when, when Chad got booted. John's video went all to hell. It, it's set on the but that, that, that's not, that's the internet. Not my first day on the internet. Thanks everybody for watching tonight. We'll see you next week.